السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحنا الصراط المستقيم. صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير الموت. عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد محمد وعلى آل سيدنا سيدنا Allah Allah Muhammad Allah 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 before the coming of Rasulullah Sallallahu all of the other months in the Islamic calendar or the lunar calendar had a lot of significance. Whether it was Muharram or Rajab or, or Ramadan or anything else. You know. Sir, I can't hear. So, so you see that you know, all of these months had significance because of various things that happened in them. With the exception of Rabbi Al-Awwal. Rabbi Al-Awwal, from an historic standpoint, there was nothing significant that happened in Rabbi Al-Awwal until the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala kept that month special just for him. But Jumadi Al-Thani, you know, many things happened before Islam. But what is significant for us is that on the 20th of this month, amongst other things, but the 20th of this month is the date of the birth of the daughter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the leader of the women of Jannah. And we'll come back to this point. But the other significant thing that happened in, in this month, that is on the 21st of, of this month, is the date of the passing of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. We'll talk about him a little bit to begin with. We all know that he was a close friend of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa even before Islam. And, you know, they were pretty much together most of the time, with the exception of the trips that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to take during his business. Even before Islam, he never did anything without first consulting Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the last person that he would see before he left anywhere from Mecca would be Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the first person he would see when he would come back would be Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So again, this is even before Islam. And this is, and he is the only companion of Rasulullah for who did not ask for any proof. When Rasulullah sallam, says to him that I am the messenger of Allah, he says I accept, without any proof. And this is one of his virtues uh, that Rasulullah sallam, himself pointed out. You know, he said one time, he said, all of you ask for proof except for Abu Bakr. He is the only companion of Rasulullah Sallallahu whose companionship can be directly proven through the Quran. Surah Tawbah, verse number 40, where Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala mentions or talks about, you know, the verse starts off with uh, talking about, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says that, you know, if you don't help him, it doesn't matter. Allah will help him, talking about Rasulullah Sallallahu 
And then he mentions, he said, Thani Athnaini, the second of the two, Tilghar, in the, in the cave. And then he says, you know, that he is the companion. When, when Rasulullah says to his companion, La tahazan ibn Allah ma'ana. Do not fear, Allah is with us. And we know, yeah, whether yeah, okay. Rasulullah does not say to him, La ta khawf. He says, La ta hazan. Khawf is what you do for yourself. I'm afraid, you know, that they might come and attack me. Ta hazan is what you do for your beloved. Because ta hazan has within it the anxiety for the one that you love. And the Rasulullah understands this about Abu Bakr. He's not worried about himself when he's saying to the Rasulullah that they are coming. They will be upon us, you know, when they're in the cave and Quraysh are looking for them. Rasulullah says to him, La ta'hazan, don't worry. Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah is with us. And in so saying, Allah is with the whole ummah so long as we are part of that ummah. And as we keep talking about these days, we have to question whether we are truly part of that ummah when parts of the ummah are suffering and we don't feel anything. So Abu Bakr, Radiallahu is the companion of the of the cave. He is also the companion of the grave. Yeah. It's interesting, you can love somebody and follow somebody in this life. Right? And I can do everything, you know, uh, in line with what my beloved wants, everything the way my beloved did, did things. But my death, I have no control over. And for Abu Bakr radiallahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his death in line with the, with the passing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you count the number of days that he was alive, it's the same number of days as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you count the day, if you look at the day that he passed, you know, when he was sick, Abu Bakr, uh, then he's, he's ill, and everybody knows that this, this will be it. He is laying with his head in the lap of his son, Abdul Rahman. And he asks Abdul Rahman, he says, what is today? He says, it's Monday. And then he says, is this, is this not the day that Rasulullah sallallahu passed? He said, yes. He said, then it would be nice for me to also pass. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfilled this dua of his. Before this though, when he's sick, you know, he calls Sayyidina Ali, karamallahu And he says to him, he says that when I pass, Bathe, bathe me with the same hands that you bathe the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi You know, the ghusl of Rasulullah sallallahu was done by Sayyidina Ali karamallahu And so it says, you, you know, because you had the honor of bathing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi then I ask that you also bathe me with those hands. And then they asked him, they said, when you pass, where do we bury you?
And his response is interesting because he says to him, he says, look, I have never done anything. Or rather, I have not done anything in my life without the consent of Rasulullah. So I'm not going to start now. So when I pass, then after you give me the ghusl, then take me in front of the rawda of Rasulullah. And ask him And as he instructed, this is exactly what they did. They took him there, <laughs> laid him in front of the door. You know, when Rasulullah Sussum passed, everybody knows that he passed in the house of Sayyidah, uh, Sayyidina Aisha Siddiqa, radiallahu anha, the wife of Rasulullah Sussum. So he passed in that house. And as is commanded, the prophets are buried where they pass. And they're not taken here or there. And this also, this narration is from Abu Bakr radiallahu himself when the question came, where do we bury him? He said, Rasulullah Sussum told me that the prophets are buried where they pass. So he passed here, we will bury him here. So he's buried in that house. And if you look at the house at that time, you know, the door was from the side. And you have the front where we go and say salam from, which is the south side. That wall was the south wall. The door was on the west. So if you're looking at it from this side, it's on the left. So here you have the door. So they take him in front of the Rauda of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, the other thing here also that's important to note, when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is buried there, Aisha Siddiqa Radim did not move. She did not leave. She continued, and the house is not that big. You know, and the house was like 12 by, by 16. That was it, that was the whole house. Yeah. He's buried there. She moves her, her bed or her cot to the back, to the north side. She continues to live there. She continues to make salat there. When they bring Abu Bakr Radha and they and the question is posted, or ask, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, they give salam to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then they ask and the, and, the, and, the, and the response comes that bring the friend to his friend and the door opens on his own. And he's taken inside and he's buried there alongside of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a little bit lower so that the head of Abu Bakr Radim, when toward, turned toward the Qibla is facing the chest of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She again, Aisha Siddiqa Radim, continues to live there. She does not move. She continues to stay there, continues to, to sleep there, continues to make Salat there. Then later, when Omar Radiyallahu passes, and before he passed, he asked her permission to be buried there. And she gives him that permission. But now what she does is she puts up a curtain between where she's, her bed is and the three graves. But again, she continues to live there. You know, she puts the curtain up because Umar Radim is not, is not mahram. Abu Bakr Radim is her father. Rasulullah Sassim is Rasulullah, but he is her husband. You know, for those who say that all relationships are cut off from death, with death, did she not understand that? 
if the way people understand this, that relate that death cuts off all relations, yes, it's true, but there is a difference in the understanding here. If they under if if she understood it the way most people understand it today, then one is either she shouldn't have stayed there, or the curtain could should have gone up right at the beginning. The curtain didn't come up until after Omar is, is buried there. But again, she continues to live there, continues to make her salat there. And so, this was a very quick synopsis of Abu Bakr. He, when he passed, he's also 63, as was Rasulullah. He has, as I said, the companion of the cave, the companion in this life, companion, the companion of the grave of Rasulullah. And he will be his companion in the hereafter as well. Now, as I said earlier, so this was the, today is the 22nd, on the 21st of Jumaat al-Akhir is when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed. On the 20th was when Bibi Fatima salamu alayha, the daughter of Rasulullah was born. She was born in the year of the mission. There is a difference of opinion, but most scholars say the year of the mission. Some say a year before, some say a year after, but most say the year of when revelation first came. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created her special for him. She, he created her from him. All of his daughters are from him, but she is different. Because she is the one through whom his lineage will continue. And if it had not been for her, then Islam would not have reached us, truly. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that the Qur'an and my Ahlul Bayt will always be together. As we've mentioned many times before, Hablillah, the rope of Allah, you know, is the Qur'an, but it is also Ahlul Bayt because these two are always together. If you look at the offspring, and she is, in, in reality, she is Kawthar. You know, if you look at the, the sign in Azul or why Surah Gothar was revealed, it was revealed twice. It is Makki, but it is also Madani. The first time it was revealed, and to explain this a little bit, there are certain verses that were revealed twice. Surah Fatiha is also revealed twice. To make sure that the people understand that there is no abrogation of these verses. You know, there are certain verses of the Quran that were abrogated. We still recite them, we still honor them, but we can't use them to make rulings or to practice them. But there are certain verses, again, that Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed twice to emphasize the meaning and to emphasize that these are not verses that will be, that someone can come back and say, oh no, well that was then and now the meaning has changed. No. The first time in Mecca, when the son of Rasulullah Sussan passes, Tahir, Abdullah, Quraysh started saying what? They said, oh, he is Abtar. Abtar means the one who has no lineage. And what is with him will, will, will die, will be finished with him. So when he passes, everything he's brought, this religion will be done. He said, hmm? he has no lineage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals, Inna a'atayna kal kawthar. Verily, without a doubt, we have given you kawthar. Kawthar, yes, it is a, a pool on the day of judgment from which Rasulullah will give water to those who are thirsty from his ummah. And whoever drinks from that well will never be thirsty again. Kawthar is also from kathrat, which means abundance. And Allah SWT has given him abundance of everything, including abundance of lineage. So the question was, 
They are saying, oh, his lineage is cut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, I have given you abundance of lineage. Through whom? Who is his lineage through? Through the Fatima salam Allah alayha. Allah says, I have given you kawthar, given you Fatima salam Allah alayha, through whom your lineage will continue forever. Rasulullah salam says, everyone's lineage will be cut except for his. Through Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنَرْ And praise, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ شَعْنِيَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that those who are saying that you are abtar, in reality they are the ones who are abtar. They are the ones whose lineages will be cut. So kawthar is the Fatima salamu la alayha. So when we look at her lineage that came through her, through Hassan and Hussein alayhi salam, who do we find other than the ones who have safeguarded this religion so that it reaches us? Those who fought against the establishment. You know, these days we think, oh, you know, the ruler. The ruler has no meaning if he is not in line with Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Doesn't matter what title he claims to hold. Imam Zaid, of course, you know, Imam Hussein al Islam is without mention. Imam Hassan al Islam, I mean, there are no words that can express the tr reality of these people. But we see the steps, and we've been talking about Imam Hassan al-Islam on the, in the Sunday classes, and we see the steps that he took to safeguard the religion, to safeguard the blood of the believers. We see the steps that Imam Hussein al-Islam took, sacrificing his whole family, just to safeguard this religion. Amongst that lineage is also Imam Zayn al-Abidin. And Imam Zayd al Abidin's sons, Imam Muhammad Baqir and Imam Zayd. Imam Zayd is the, is, the, is the one to whom Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi gave bay'ah, gave allegiance to. About whom Imam Abu Hanifa said that I have never met anyone more knowledgeable than Imam Zayd. About whom Imam Jafar Sadiq who is his nephew, who is also amongst the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa, that I said that there is no one amongst the Ahlul Bayt who is more knowledgeable about the Sunnah and, no, and, and more practicing of the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sassam than Imam Zaid. And Imam Zaid is the one who gathered the army to go fight the leader, Hisham bin Abdul Malik. Of course, you know, his army betrayed him, or most of his army betrayed him, and he's martyred. But he took that step, again, to safeguard the religion, to safeguard the blood of the believers. Uh, Imam Malik, you know, everybody knows the name of Imam Malik. Rahmatullah alayhi. He used to learn from whom? From Imam Muhammad Baqir, Imam Jafar Sadiq, Imam Musa Kadhin. Again, the sons of the Fatima Salam Alayha. She is the leader of the women of Jannah. And we all say this, and we all, you know, superficially know this, but we don't think. Who all is going to be in Jannah? You know, because unfortunately, when most of us, when we make this statement, or when we hear the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi saying that she is the leader of the women of Jannah, we think about the average women. Who is going to be in Jannah? There will be within Jannah the wives of the prophets, the daughters of the prophets, the mothers of the prophets, including Bibi Maryam, Salamu Alayha, and all the rest of them. 
but they will all have one leader. And that will be the daughter of Rasulullah. She is the pleasure of Rasulullah. She is the part of a part of Rasulullah. And this is why Imam Malik he, he said, he said that how can I? You know, because the question came up of of, of Fazila of Abzal, who is greater. He says, how, how can I place anything or anyone above even a part of Rasulullah? Yeah. If I take the hair of Rasulullah, the blessed hair of Rasulullah, there is nothing in creation that can even approach the status of even the hair of Rasulullah that has come off of his body. Nothing. You know, we all know like Zamzam. Zamzam is the greatest water on this earth. That we know, that we normally think of. But there is water that, has, that, has, that, that this earth has seen. That is even greater than the water in Jannah. That is the water that came forth from the fingers of Rasulullah. So that 1400 companions could make wudu. Even a drop of the sweat of Rasulullah is superior over all of the rest of creation. Because it is from him, connected to him. And so this again, coming back to what I was saying initially, this is why Imam Malik rahmatullah, he says that how can I compare, compare anyone to even a part of Rasulullah? So he says that this is why he says that he says be Fatima salamu alayha and Ibrahim salam, the son of Rasulullah are superior to everyone else in creation other than the prophets including Abu Bakr and including Ali radiallahu anhu you know, this is the opinion of Imam Malik Because the Rasulullah sort of said about her that she is a part of me. minni. But he didn't stop here. He said she is a part of me and whatever pleases her pleases me and whatever displeases her displeases me. So the pleasure of Rasulullah lies in the pleasure of Fatima salamu and this is why Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu said, he said that I prefer to do good to the family or to the household of Rasulullah so some, before I prefer to do good to my own household. We know, you know, when her father was ill, when Rasulullah is ill and, and uh, they, people realize that this is probably time. So she came to him and Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu is the narrator of this hadith. And she says that the Fatima salamu alayhi came and Rasulullah said something to her. And she started crying almost inconsolably started crying. And then he says something to her and suddenly you get the opposite reaction. She starts laughing, smiling. And they didn't know, the wives of Rasulullah did not know what she had said or what he had said to her until she passed. And then they realized that what he had said to her was that she would be the first from the household to follow him. 
So six months after his passing, in the month of Ramadan, she passes. But before she passes, she no one else gave her ghusl. You know, she was so modest. When she was asked what is the best ibadah of the women, she said that to, wor to put worship Allah in the innermost room of the house with the door closed. She did her own ghusl and she put on her own kafan and she laid down and she was gone. And before this, she had told her husband that if I pass during the day, then bury, and, or at night, bury me at night so that no one can see me. Yeah. No one can even see the silhouette of the coffin. Time's up. Uh, inshallah, we'll pick up on other things next week. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and, and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Allah and his companions and all of those whom they love. And may he protect our brothers and sisters in Palestine and, and throughout the world. And uh, may he give victory to those who are fighting in his cause. Uh, and may he uh, destroy the, the, those who are the oppressors. Uh, those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah.